Welcome into the Wednesday Bible Study. It's June the 22nd, 2022. Very hot and dry outside. We're comfortable inside here where they got a little bit of AC uh, going, and hopefully you have some AC going where you're at as well. As always, we're going to be looking into the Word of God. We're going to open to Matthew 15 this week because we're going to advance in our study of this great book, the first book of the New Testament written by the Apostle Matthew. And as we have been looking through the week or through the year already, we've actually been engaging in an understanding of what was Matthew's overall purpose, trying to put everything in perspective of what Matthew was trying to communicate, a true and proper interpretation of the scripture, but then also look at the application of that truth to our individual lives. So we are in Matthew 15. Remember the overall theme of this book has been Christ is the King. He started with the lineage of Christ, the birth of Christ, fulfilling so many prophecies. He, he introduced the man who introduced Christ in chapter 3. He looked at John the baptizer, saw that great victory Jesus had. We looked into what Jesus had to say in the, the great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. We looked at things that Jesus did where Matthew gave emphasis to 10 specific miracles that Jesus did. Now, even in our chapter today, we're not going to get to it in our study today of Matthew 15, but in this chapter, there's going to be a miracle. The things that happen in Matthew chapter 15 in the first 20 verses that we will look at today are most likely going to come after the miracle that we looked at last week in the feeding of the 5,000. So, while Matthew's 8 through 10, chapters 8 through 10, does focus on 10 specific miracles, that wasn't all the miracles that Jesus did, but Matthew recorded them in, in a collective in those three chapters because of the point that he was making. We looked at what Jesus said. We looked at what Jesus did. Where we have been since chapter 11 is looking at how people responded to Jesus, their reactions toward Jesus, and even more specifically, how did Jesus react to their reaction? And in chapter 14, we had focused on Herod, and then, of course, the, the other material that's there. This week, as we enter into Matthew 15, we're actually going to have a delegation of scribes coming from Jerusalem, Pharisees, that are going to come and question Jesus regarding the practices of his disciples. And we'll see Jesus' answer in that. Before we get into Matthew 15, I want to invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study, where we are studying the book of Matthew, but it allows you to be interactive in an open discussion of the material of the book. Uh, for that reason, we're a little bit behind our regular Wednesday Bible study here on Facebook, as we're currently in chapter 10 in that live Bible study. But it gives an occasion where we're able to open up and and discuss things, and if there are questions that, that members of the class have, we are able to put that on the table, open it up for discussion. If we can't answer it that night, then we will be sure to get back to it the next week. So you're always welcome to come and, and participate in that Bible class. We also, on that Wednesday evening occasion, we sing some songs of praise to God, and we pray unto Him. We communicate with our Heavenly Father, and it may be that you would desire to come and and participate or be a part of, of that prayer meeting where we come together and meet to communicate to our Heavenly Father. On Sundays, we have a Bible study at 10 a.m. We have a worship occasion at 11 dedicated to practicing the New Testament pattern for worship where we sing, we pray, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we give of our means. As God has blessed us, we have an occasion to give back, to, to help His work in his church and we we take time to preach the word you'll be an honored guest if you'd come and be with us again sunday evenings at six o'clock now this coming sunday uh, the 29th of june is going to be our dinner day so instead of a six o'clock evening worship we'll meet at 2 p.m uh, for our evening worship after the meal that we have together we reconvene in the auditorium for a, an evening worship uh, time. So we'd love to have you come and visit with us. And anytime there are questions, you can always pose those questions and we'd be glad to answer them either privately or 
uh, as, as we're able to here on Facebook. So Matthew chapter 15. Our goal today is to focus in on the first 20 verses. They are really, it's a two-part section. Jesus is going to deal with a question that the, the scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem are going to pose. And then he's, he's actually going to answer that question as well to the entire multitude uh, that is there. So he'll directly have something to say to the scribes and Pharisees. In verse 10, he'll call the multitude together and he'll discuss the matter in their presence. So uh, we're going to look at these first 20 verses of Matthew 15 and focus on the reaction that these scribal Pharisees from Jerusalem had uh, toward Jesus. And we'll simply refer to it as, uh, we'll, we'll say it's unconciliatory. Their reaction to Jesus is something of antagonism. They are going to be questioning Jesus with motives of, of impropriety. They're, they're going to try to diminish Jesus in the presence of the people. And it's going to be an ongoing thing. In fact, in the book of Mark, when you read in, in Mark chapter 7, uh, or rather John chapter 7, right after the feeding of the 5,000 and the multitude, so many of them depart because of the words that Jesus had to say there in John 6, you also have Peter's confession. Thou art the, the Christ, um, you know, thou hast the words of life. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. And then in verse 1 of chapter 7 of John, it said he walked no more in Jewry. The, the idea is he, he didn't descend to Jerusalem uh, for any time period. He walked in Galilee where he was able to better and more openly uh, reach the people. Uh, and it says specifically because the Jews there wanted to kill him. And so there is an open hostility that is brewing. There is a growing animosity and antagonism. These, these Pharisees are going to not only be unreasonable with Jesus, they're actually going to begin turning their venom toward him in, in trying to undermine and destroy him. And ultimately it will lead to the cross, the great climax that we talked about in the introduction to the book. But we settle in on this these first 15 verses. And what we want to do today is kind of go down through these 15 verses in expository fashion, kind of explain what's going on and, and what the questions are that are posed. And then we want to end the day with some lessons to consider, some points to ponder uh, from this section, things that we learn that we need to really uh, be aware of that we need to focus on and even be on guard against. So let, let's take this verse number one beginning. It says, Then came Jesus to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now I want you to underscore the fact that they are questioning regarding the traditions of the elders. They are not questioning regarding violations of the law of Moses. In fact, they were never able to substantiate any violation that Jesus made, much less his disciples, regarding the law of Moses. And you're also going to note that there, there is an overwhelming um, uh, focus on traditions of the elders more so than the commands of God. And Jesus is even going to make a stark contrast to that. When he gets down to verse um, number five, he says, But ye say, ye say, whosoever shall say to his father and mother, you say this. But in verse four, it was God who commanded. So there's going to be a stark contrast between the commandments of God and the traditions of men, or the traditions of the elders. Now, the particular tradition of the elders, and I might mention here too that the word that you might commonly hear with regard to this uh, in, in studies pertaining to uh, the traditions of the Jews or Jewish traditions would be the Talmud. 
And the Talmud is basically a collection, as I understand it, it's a, a compilation uh, written concerning the traditions that, that were held. And for the most part, those traditions became more strongly entrenched and ingrained in people than did the law of God. So this particular tradition, there were a lot of them, but the particular one that they're focused on now is that the, the disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. Now, hygiene aside, I was taught from an early age, did a lot of playing outside when I was young. Uh, most children, we, we didn't spend a lot of time in front of a computer, in front of a phone or behind a phone. Didn't spend a lot of time with video games. We spent a lot of time outside playing in the yard. We may be playing uh, some sport. We may be playing uh, some kind of, uh, you know, riding our bike, exercise, just doing something outside. And so when it was time to come in, it was generally uh, understood and it was often said, go wash your hands. So you come in from outside, you wash your hands. Your hands have gotten dirty from being outside, whatever the playing was that you were doing as a child. And, and your mother would say to you, wash your hands, it's time to eat. Go wash up. So good hygiene is something we do understand. It's always good. Not that we always do it, but it's typically good and it's hygienically acceptable to wash your hands before you eat. However, when you look to the Word of God, there is no command from God that would make it morally wrong, that is, that would make it sinful to eat without first washing your hands. This was a tradition of the Jews, a tradition of the elders. And Jesus in Mark chapter 7, in Mark's account of this event, would actually include not only the washing of the hands, but the washing of pots and vessels and so forth all of the various washings that were um, levied upon this, this people by the tradition of the elders. And this tradition may have evolved from a time period just after Babylonian captivity leading up to this point, may have even been before Babylonian captivity, uh, but most likely it originated well after the Babylonian captivity when, you know, basically uh, there was a a uh, decline and a decaying in the, the moral and spiritual understanding of the people. And so washing their hands. Typically, the idea was you would pour water over your hand, hold your hands upright. And this, according to a, a uh, uh, scholar in uh, Marvin Vincent in his uh, Greek word studies, looking at this idea of washing hands, he depicts it in his notes on this particular subject in Matthew chapter 15 of holding the hands up, pouring the water over the hands while rubbing, balling your hand into a fist and rubbing the other hand so as to clean it. And you could not let your hands down because once that water came down, it had to come as far as your wrist. Generally, the wrist was considered part of the hand, but the water had to descend to the wrist. It could not, you could not wash with your hands lowered like we would commonly do, putting them under a faucet. Our hands are going to be in a downward angle. They wouldn't necessarily have to hold them up because if the water ran back down the fingers, your hand was still considered unclean. Very ritualistic in what they did. Uh, there, there had to be a certain cleansing of one hand before you could use it to scrub the other. Uh, but this was the particular tradition uh, that was levied. Now, Jesus is going to answer the question, and, and by his answer, he is actually going to be condemning the practice of the Jews. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 3. He answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now, it's interesting that he uses the term also here. The idea that, yes, his disciples did violate the tradition of the fathers or of the elders, but yet that tradition was not authoritative. So they hadn't done anything that was mortally wrong. They, they hadn't done anything that was sinful. 
they had not stuck to the tradition that the elders had levied upon the people or that had come to be levied upon the people. But on the other hand, he says, you transgress the commandment of God by your traditions. In binding these certain traditions, you violated the laws of God, or it puts you in a position where you would necessarily violate the law of God in order to keep that tradition. He mentions one specifically. In verse number four, he says, for God commanded, and notice this, this is the commandment of God. This is what God enjoined upon all the children of Israel to do. And I might mention this, this binding of this commandment is also part of the law of Christ because Paul will talk about it in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. All right, so honor father and mother. And we know this to be a commandment, one of the ten engraved on the first table of stones. So here is what God has said, Honor your father and your mother. The word honor comes from a Greek term that actually means to place value upon. And so if they're going to affix value to their mother and father, that then that is a, a couple who is going to receive due attention from their children. So if we really affix a, a value upon a mother and father, upon our mother and father, as Jesus was saying the commandment was for these Jews to do, then naturally they were going to respect them. They were going to even provide for them in, in a time of, of older age. They were going to supply for need. They were going to make provision. And so when you say honor, you, you, know, you might use the term support, even financially. But the idea of fixing value upon it is just literally what, what was supposed to be uh, done. You affix a value upon your mother and your father, and that value that you affix to them, meaning they're valuable to you, what do you do with things that are valuable to you? You preserve, you protect, you look out for, you, you stand guard over or for. And so you, you're just very careful about how you treat that, which is of value to you. So this is the command of God, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, if you're going to curse father and mother, and the word curse means to abuse, it means to speak evil of, it means to mistreat, it means even in, in contrast to honor, to fail to put value upon. You fail to give the value due unto your mother and your father, then you are cursing your mother or father. You're, you're through at least your action speaking evil of them. And he says, if that be the case, then God says, let him die the death. And the meaning of the phrase, let him die the death, simply means let him suffer the consequence of his action. And of course, the, the law of Moses demanded an execution. It demanded a capital punishment for those who failed to honor father and mother. So let him die the death. Let him die that death that is demanded uh, by the law. Let it be carried out. Let the execution take place. That's what God had to say about it. But notice the contrast here in verse number five. But ye say, ye say, whosoever shall say to his father and mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God none effect by your tradition. Now, what does this mean to say it is a gift? In Mark 7, uh, the term Corban is used. The idea here was that they would claim that by which their parents would be benefited, a monetary support, it would be dedicated or gifted to the temple. And if it was dedicated or gifted to the temple, then it was dedicated or gifted to God, and thereby they couldn't use it for any other purpose than for the purposes of God. And in so doing, they, they would relieve themselves of any responsibility toward their own parents. Now, 
First of all, realize that no two commands of God would ever go in violation one of another. It is never going to be a, a problem to honor your father and mother while at the same time being faithful to God. It's never going to be that you, you are required to do something for God that would prevent you from honoring your father and your mother. So we know that truth is like train tracks. They're parallel. They never get perpendicular. They never cross. They're always going to be in harmony one with another, running parallel. So you can always fulfill a command of God and never be in violation of another command of God. It's just the nature of truth. If at any time you ever find yourself being crossed to where to do one thing would put you in violation of another thing, supposed commands of God, then no one of those at least is not actually a command of God. So they would take the command of God and set it aside. The idea there that he says you, you make it of none effect is, is the idea that you void it. You, you deem that it has no authority. It, it is not something that is um, binding upon you or that to which you are amenable. It, it has no teeth. It has no validity. It has no authority to make demands of you. And so that which they would then dedicate to the temple or to the service of God, they would feel relieved from supporting their parents with it. Now, a couple of things here that we might want to understand about that. One of the problems with that is that they overlook the command of God to honor their father and their mother. That's one thing. One of the other things about it is the ones who were claiming Corbin or saying it is a gift were oftentimes those that were involved in the work of the temple. They were priests. They were Levites. They were individuals who, in supporting the temple, would see a return to their own pocket. So by claiming it as a gift to the temple, they were able to hold on to it themselves and not support their parents. So they were, they were utilizing that tradition to alleviate their responsibility to the commands of God. What hypocrisy. They come along and they say that the disciples of Jesus are, are eating with defiled hands, unclean hands. So they're defiling themselves. While at the same time, they set aside an actual command of God in order to keep the tradition. So Jesus doesn't say his disciples were not guilty of violating the tradition. He says, they may be. They were. But what is it? What of it? You're violating the actual command of God. And so verse 1 through uh, 9, Jesus answers that. He also says here in verse number 7 through verse number 9, I think it's important to make a note here as well. He says, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying. Now what that means is, well did Isaiah say. He's just basically saying, in other words, Isaiah painted a beautiful picture of you. His words give forth a portrait of exactly the kind of people you are. That's what he says to the scribes and Pharisees. So what was this portrait that Isaiah painted with his words? This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. So coming forth from their lips, their verbal uh, capabilities, they are drawing nigh to God. So they can talk a good talk. They can talk a good game. They can express by the words of their mouth as to how close they are to God. But he says, their heart is far from me. So here are some some Jewish scribes and Pharisees who claim that they have a moral high ground. They are closer to God than anybody else. And the basis of that is the traditions of the elders which they are keeping that the Lord's disciples are violating. And yet Jesus says, while you talk a good talk, 
or you you say words that would seem to indicate you you be, belong to the Lord, you're serving the Lord, that you're close to the Lord, your heart's another matter. It's a far ways from God. No heart in what they were doing. Verse number nine says, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. When you insert these doctrines of men for the gospel, when you insert teachings and doctrines of men, dogmas of men, in the place of the commands of God, you make everything about what you're doing worthless. So while these Pharisees and these scribes could have the words in their mouth that would seem to indicate they were close to God, everything that they were doing was actually vain or worthless. It had no value to it. That's interesting. He told them to put value upon their parents and then tells them that your worship has no value because you're more concerned about the traditions of men than you are the commands of God. So in verse 1 through 9, there is a there is a clear um, animosity. There's a clear distinction. Uh, there is a, a very clear battle line that has been drawn between Jesus and those Pharisees. There's a schism between them. And no wonder then that Jesus would, would walk no more in Jewry or in Judea, in that area around Jerusalem, in that point of his earthly ministry and would stick to Galilee because they were out to kill him. There's a clear antagonism uh, on the part of the, the scribes and these Pharisees. There's a clear uh, animosity that, that they have for him. Now, notice here as we pick up with verse number 10 through verse number 20, that Jesus is going to address the multitude. He says, hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Remember the argument or the question that the scribes and Pharisees had posed is, why do your disciples eat with defiled hands? And the indication is, if they're eating with defiled hands, then they themselves have become defiled. They are defiled if they're eating with defiled hands. And Jesus says, it's not what goes into the mouth physically that defiles a man. They're about to eat food. It's not the food that they ate and the, the fact that they washed their hands that truly defiles a man. Jesus says it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. And the reason being is because what comes out of the mouth is an indicator of the heart. Remember, this people drew nigh with their mouth, but not with their heart. And what was coming out of their mouth was a clear indication of their heart. Now, he says, uh, that which goeth in doesn't defile a man, but that which comes out. Their, their accusations, their aggravation, their antagonism indicated truly what was in their heart. So Jesus makes it clear to the multitude what really defiles you is what comes out, what you say, the things that come forth from the heart. And he'll even talk about that in verse 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. So we need to be clear about what truly defiles. In verse 12, the disciples let Jesus know, you've offended the, the uh, Pharisees. You have caused them to be upset with you. What you had to say ruffled their feathers. Now, this is the reaction of Jesus that is so, so clear and important as you think about Matthew's purpose. Jesus didn't cow cow to them. Oh, sure, they were the leaders. And sure, they were going to lead the charge to crucify him. But Jesus didn't relent in his position. He didn't apologize for the truth just because they were upset with him. He stood his ground. He was firm. In fact, he answered his disciples this way, saying, Every plant which my heavenly Father had not planted shall be rooted up. We're using a comparison to physical things. It just so happens that it's that time of year 
in which a lot of people are gardening. I happen to, to do a little gardening myself, and, and even this morning I was looking at one of the garden spots that I have. I'm trying to work three different garden spots right now, uh, two of them rather uh, small in area, uh, less than an acre, and one that's a little bigger than, than that. Um, so in, in looking at this, I, I look over my gardens and, and you know, there are things growing in my garden that I didn't plant in one particular garden spot this morning, I was looking at some speckled butter beans that I had planted and they're putting on butter beans and, and it won't be long. They'll be growing, but in the midst of, of some of that butter bean, uh, patch is what's known as coffee weed. At least that's what we call it here in lower Alabama. I didn't plant that coffee weed, and it actually needs to be eradicated from the garden. So what did I do this morning when I came upon a coffee weed seed or coffee weed plant? I pulled it up. I didn't plant that. I don't want it growing there. It's not something that's productive to my garden, and so I pull it out. Not only is it not productive to the garden, it actually is destructive to the garden because those weeds actually take away the nutrients and the, uh, the uh, moisture that my butter beans need. They take away something else I've, I've got growing there is morning glory. You don't let that grow very long, otherwise it takes over the whole thing. And so I'm looking at my okra. And I noticed that I've got a couple morning glory vines started. I eradicate them. I pull them out. I pluck them up. I didn't plant those. And I don't intend for them to grow there. So I pulled them out. Jesus is using an analogy. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. And the natural comparison is plants equal people. Or plants equal false teaching or plants equals traditions of men rather than the commandments of God. And so every plant, everything that God did not plant, that does not come from him, ultimately he is going to root it up. He's going to pull it out by the roots. He is going to destroy it. And what Jesus is indicating to his disciples, and later on he's actually going to be even more specific about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, He's going to say what they are planting, what they are spreading, the doctrine that they're teaching, and the kind of people they are, are not the kind of plants that God has planted. And ultimately, they will be rooted up. So you say, I've angered them. I've offended them. Well, they're not plants my Heavenly Father planted, Jesus says. And, and so if they're offended, they're just going to have to be offended. He goes on to say in verse 14, let them alone. Leave them to their self. They're not plants which God planted. Leave them alone. That is, don't follow them. Don't adhere to them. Don't take their teaching and even don't be concerned. They've made false, false accusation. They've levied a false claim of, of immorality or a false behavior. Pay it no attention. Let them alone. They, that is those Pharisees that you say I've offended, they're blind leaders and they're leading blind people. Mm -hmm. And when blind people are led by blind leaders, the end result is both fall into the ditch or both come to destruction. And so there's two different ways here that Jesus talks about the Pharisees, comparing them to plants that haven't been planted intentionally or purposefully or to blind leaders guiding blind men, ending up both in the ditch. And, and Peter wants to know, what does this mean in verse 15? Are you out also without understanding? Jesus would say, do you not understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and it's cast into the drought? Now again, we return to that false doctrine or that false tradition that was there being bound as the word of God. Don't you understand that it's not eating with unwashed hands that makes you defiled? The word defiled means to render unholy. It means to render unhallowed. It means to profane that which is holy. And you and I are called to be holy. 
Luke, or uh, rather Leviticus 16, is a clear call to the Jewish people, be therefore holy, for I am holy. First Peter uh, chapter 1 would say the same thing for you and I, that as our God is holy, as he who hath called us is holy, so we should be holy in all manner of godliness and conversation. In every aspect of life, we are to be holy as well. And so as we are to be holy, what would cause us to be unholy? It's not that which goes in or that a man takes in. That is like eating with unwashed hands. It's what comes out because what comes out is an indication of what's in the heart. And so the matter of, of being unholy has everything to do with where our heart is, what our heart is fixed upon. And that's why we ought to, as Paul said in Colossians 3, set our affections on things above, not things on the earth. So we have this, this condition or this situation with the Pharisees, the scribes from Jerusalem, who would question and then be so antagonistic toward Jesus, and thus they're unconciliatory in their reaction. Take note of Jesus's action because he responds as one who is a king, one who has authority himself. And he is not concerned about what their authority is or what they claim to have the authority to bind. If it's not the commandments of God, then it doesn't have that authority. So what do we glean from that? What do we learn from that? I hope what we've already done in kind of exposing the text a little bit brings to light some things that, that you may have already known, but at least has expounded or explained what is taking place here in the text. I want you to think about a few things here, maybe one, two, three, four, five. I got six things uh, that are observatory. Observations, lessons gleaned from the text. So number one, it goes back to these traditions that the elders had about eating with unwashed hands. And I'll, I'll simply put it this way. An old opinion does not equate to the authority or will of God. So it may be something that's long been held. And it's been believed a long time. Maybe you as an individual have believed something relative to the Bible a very long time. That doesn't necessarily equate to it being right. Just because it's been long accepted by men, just because it's been long believed by men, doesn't mean that it is the commandment of God. It's been long believed by many that baptism isn't essential, that baptism doesn't save. When in fact, the word of God says in 1 Peter 3.21 that baptism doth also now save us. Now, if God's word explicitly says baptism doth also now save, then the one who says, no matter how long he has said it, that baptism doesn't save, he's not right. And his long-held opinion is not authoritative, but God's word is. So an old opinion doesn't equate to authority if that which is being said is not of God. That means we have to be sure that what we're teaching and what we're practicing actually came from God. Can that be said of what you believe in practice? That it's actually of God? Can you go to the Bible with a thus saith the Lord, a book, chapter, and verse supporting what you do? Remember, Colossians 3.17 said, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means everything must be done by his authority. And just because it was an opinion that was long held doesn't mean that it's his authority. Number two, and I, I think this is very important to remember as well, because sometimes men get discouraged when this, this kind of thing happens. The scribes and Pharisees have aligned themselves against Jesus. And so now what they're going to do, remember, they're, they're focused now on the traditions of men because there was nothing regarding the law of Moses that they could attack. Now they're seeking for anything by which they may find fault with Jesus. They're fault finding. And men will always find fault with the holiest of God's servants. Now what we mean by that is, no matter how strong you are in faith, 
no matter how faithful to God you are, there are going to be those who try to pick you apart and try to undermine the character that God actually knows you have. It happened to Jesus. Their attack here relative to the disciples of Jesus is actually an attack on Jesus. They're seeking to find fault with him because it's understood that a disciple in his activities bears uh, upon the, the master. And so if the disciples are eating with unwashed hands, Jesus becomes guilty by his position as master over those disciples. So they're looking to find fault with them. There are always those that will question the integrity of your character. There will always be those in this world who are going to question the legitimacy of your faith. So when, when you think about that and know that, and, and you have that firmly fixed in your mind, then you're going to be ready to deal with it. You, you have to know it. Jesus said, blessed are ye when men shall persecute you, shall revile you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For so persecuted they the prophets. So in Matthew chapter 5, with that eighth beatitude, Jesus actually even addressed the idea or the problem that was going to be exhibited against him. He was going to be persecuted. He was going to be evil spoken of. But yet he would be faithful to the Lord. Blessed are ye. And speaks to that enduring. So number one, an old opinion doesn't equate to the authority if it's not of God. Number two, there will always be those fault finders. There will always be those who are going to question your integrity. Don't let them win. You endure. You be faithful, for great is your reward in heaven. Number three, God, or in this case Christ, is your king. And he is to be obeyed above all others. Do not allow the traditions of men to cause disobedience to God's commands. Man may have a lot of traditions. Man may have a lot of practices that in and of themselves wouldn't be wrong. But if those things ever bring you to a point where you stand in violation of the command of God, you've got to give up those traditions of men and hold to the righteous traditions of God. So number three, God is, or Christ is our king. That's what Matthew is focused on. He is our king. And his law, that which is authorized by his command, has always got to take precedent over the traditions of men. He has to be obeyed above all others. Number four, follow those who follow Christ. Jesus talked about blind guides leading blind followers and how both will fall into the ditch. The blindness here is not a reference to physical eyesight. It was a reference to the mental understanding that they were lacking. They didn't understand spiritual things, and yet they were trying to lead people who didn't have spiritual understanding into spiritual things, and they destroy themselves and those that follow them. What we need to be doing is looking for those who are following Christ and imitating them. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Paul said, Be followers of me as I am of Christ, or be followers of me as dear children, and follow me as I follow Christ. So the only extent by which Paul was a legitimate example to follow is where he was exemplifying Christ in things wherein he was following the example of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 3, he told the Philippian brethren, in and around verse 14 through 17, to, to take note of those who were good men, who were good people, who were faithful, and mark them that so walk as ye have, as ye have us for an example. So you mark them, you take note of them, you keep your eye on them, and you follow that example. In the scriptures, we are called upon to observe and follow the example of, of others. But in this case, 
uh, we're talking about the examples that we need to follow. And there are those who don't know where they're going. They don't know how to get there. They have no spiritual understanding. And if you hit your wagon to them, you're going to be in a ditch. You're going to be in a rut. You're going to fall into destruction. But if you'll follow those who are truly following Jesus, and the only way you know that they're following Jesus is by comparing what they do and what they say to what the Bible actually says. Are they imitating Jesus? If they are, follow them. Mark them which so walk. Getting again to the blind leaders of the blind. And, and of course, we're talking here about our, our fifth observation, but right on the heels of follow those who follow Christ, realize that the defiled don't always uh, know they are defiled. They're not always self-aware of their true condition. And sometimes it's not until the introduction of something better, in this case, the gospel, it's not until the introduction of the gospel that they know that they have been blind. They don't know of their defilement. It takes that better influence in order to, to, awake, to awaken or to open their consciousness to better life. The idea here that we're talking about, in the world there are blind leaders, and there are those who are blind in following them. The point we're trying to make now, based on that, is for you and myself to so make our lives such that we introduce to others this better way, the way of Christ, so that they can see and that they can have their conscience awakened to a better way and thus be able to follow it. Some people are defiled simply because they don't know any better. And if they never see the better way, the way of Christ, they'll remain in that blind condition. And so we're trying to help open the eyes of the blind. And then finally, understand what truly defiles a man is important. What we mean is, Knowing and understanding that which truly defiles. Jesus said there that the things that defile a man come out of the heart. The evil thoughts, the murders, the adulteries, the fornications, the thefts, the false witness, the blasphemies. Those are the things that really defile a person. Understand that knowing that, recognizing it, is, is very important. In Revelation 21 and verse number 27, toward the end of the Bible, Almost, you know, you got one more chapter to go after this verse. I want you to listen to what John says relative to the kingdom of God, a focus on the heavenly home. He says, and there shall in no wise enter into it, into heaven, anything that defileth, there's that word defileth, that which is defiled. It's important to understand what it is because nothing shall enter into heaven that is defiled, that is unholy, that is profane. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those that are written in the Lamb's book of life are undefiled. They're no longer defiled. They've been justified. They've been washed. They've been cleansed. And so their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The reason it's so important to understand what truly defiles a man, it's not eating with unwashed hands. Though hygienically, physically, that's probably a good thing to do. Wash your hands before you eat. But that's not what truly defiles you. And in understanding what truly defiles a man, you can avoid those things. You can eradicate those things from your life so that you can remain undefiled and be able to enter into heaven. So how are you doing with that today? You consider this interaction in the response that the Pharisees had toward Jesus with those scribes from Jerusalem, unconciliatory. They were such that they were antagonistic to Jesus. They were at odds with Jesus. They truly were defiled. 
while accusing the disciples of Jesus of being defiled. How about you today? Are you defiled before God? Why not cleanse it? Why not clean it up? Why not obey the gospel? Why not be faithful unto God so that you can be undefiled? Remember, it's the commandments of God being instilled and implemented within your life that are going to render you clean. So how are you doing with the commands of God today?